even if things go completely right, especially if they go completely right, that baby will be gone. And there will be a beautiful five-year-old or teenager or young adult in their place who you will love immensely with a love that deepens with every new incarnation. And that particular incarnation of your child is completely vanished. So cherish those moments and really sink into them. Let yourself be present for them. You're listening to the Mindful Mama podcast, episode 174. Today, we're talking about motherhood as a spiritual practice with Anne Cushman. Welcome to the Mindful Mama podcast. Here, it's about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. At Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm your host, Hunter Clark Fields, Mindful Mama Mentor. I help smart, thoughtful parents stay calm so they can have strong, connected relationships with their children. I've been practicing mindfulness for over 20 years. I'm the creator of the Mindful Parenting Membership, and I'm the author of the upcoming new book, Raising Good Humans, a mindful guide to breaking the cycle of reactive parenting and raising kind, confident kids. Welcome back to the podcast. I am so glad to be in your ears if you're new. Welcome as well to you. I'm so glad that you're here. This is a very cool episode that you are going to be listening to. Very, um, very moving. And I can't wait for you to have this conversation with Ann Cushman. And let me just tell you a little bit about her. She's pretty amazing. She is a teacher at the Spirit Rock Meditation Center and author of The Mama Sutra, a story of love, loss, and the path of motherhood. And I really think that, you know, parenthood tests us in ways that we could have never anticipated. And it really is like a spiritual practice for unprecedented growth and change. So I am so excited for you to sit down at the table with me as I talk to Anne. I want you to listen for how we never know what is going to happen, right? How loving someone is an inherently risky thing to do. How parenting is like a spiritual practice and that spiritual practices ask you to test yourself in extreme situations. And we can say, we know it's an extreme situation sometimes, right? And I want you to listen for that takeaway of Don't make any assumptions about your child. You'll hear her story of her son's diagnosis, which is really, really powerful. But before we dive into this episode, I want to give a quick shout out randomly. Thank you for some Apple podcast reviews. Um, Thanks so much, Muriel F. and Mommy New Year and... Shell Sarah Shell for your five star reviews. Thank you so much. Mommy New Year called it the podcast every mom needs. And Muriel said it's a rich and loving podcast. Oh gosh, I'm feeling the love now. Thank you so very much. I really, really appreciate that. It makes a huge difference for me to see those reviews and it helps other people get to the podcast. So thank you. Thank you so much. In my world right now, we I am getting ready to be traveling to France later this summer. And I should have probably wrapped up by the time you listen to this, the registration for the Mindful Mama Transformation Coaching Group. Right now, as of the recording, I have a couple spots left. They may be gone by the time I record this, but if you are interested, you can learn more and see if it's at the wait list or not at mindfulmamamentor.com slash group coaching, or if you have any questions, you can always, about that, you can email me at hunter at mindfulmamamentor.com. But this is the way to work with me for this year. They won't be doing anything else for the rest of the year. This is it. So if you're interested, do contact me and check it out at mindfulmamamentor.com slash group coaching. And now on to this episode. And thank you so much for coming on the Mindful Mama podcast. I am so happy to be here with you today, Hunter. I am so happy to be here, have you here with me too, because I 
loved your book. I loved it. And, you know, it's funny because your work, The Mama Sutra, is a work of nonfiction, but it's full of so many stories from the heart uh, that I just, I read it like a work of fiction and just couldn't stop reading it. So I just wanted to tell you that first. (laughs) Thank you so much. Well, I really wrote it hoping that it would touch the hearts of other mothers. So I'm glad it touched you. And it really, really does. And I'm really excited also to talk to you because you're in this place um, in the world of mindfulness. You know, you you come from, have a Buddhist background and also in the world of yoga, which those are places where, you know, I'm in those worlds too. And so I wonder, I'm just kind of like looking back for you. I wonder as a a yogi and a mindfulness practitioner, as someone who'd gone on all kinds of meditation retreats, What were your expectations for yourself as far as going into pregnancy and motherhood? Well, it's very interesting to look back at the naive person I was (laughs) as I went into it. I knew that it was going to be a challenge and an adventure and unlike anything I had done before. And I also had this idea that because I was so well-trained in the practices of yoga, of staying present, I'd traveled all over India carrying a backpack, I'd been challenged in many, many ways in my practice and in my life, that I thought mothering would be fairly straightforward. And that because of my yoga background and my mindfulness background, I would stay centered, I would stay calm, and my baby would be like this little Buddha, and I would do (laughs) everything right so that my baby would never cry and would never spit up. And if there were any kinds of problems, then I would just do attachment parenting, follow the steps of attachment parenting, and they would all go away. And it was really uh, remarkable as I embarked on the journey to realize that much like traveling in India, I had had no idea what was coming and that I was challenged and my heart expanded in ways that I never could have expected. Yeah, I I was wondering about that because I had a similar experience of like, oh, I'm like meditating in this meditation group as I'm pregnant. This baby's going to be amazing. (laughs) And I thought pregnancy, I thought childbirth will be a breeze. Everyone told me you're a yoga teacher. It's going to be so easy for you. So I didn't even like try to plan for it at all. I was like, okay, it'll be fine. Um, So I can totally relate to where you're coming from and also to that idea of just being hit by the intensity of of parenting and of motherhood and you your story starts um with um an extra layer of intensity an extra layer of um of grief and sadness and loss and before we dive into this i you know i i want to reassure the listener that there's there's so much more that also comes after this. So hang on while Anne tells you. I'd, would you would you mind sharing what happened with your first pregnancy and and how that sort of shaped and changed you? Yes. Well, my first pregnancy ended in tragedy, and my beautiful daughter was stillborn. Um, she was born a week before her due date, um, and basically in a completely mysterious way that we never knew or understood why, she died a week before her due date while she was still inside me. Hmm. Wow. I imagine still that's so hard to, to think about and to talk about. It is. It's, it's very hard to talk about, and I don't often talk about it, actually, but I wrote about it because... One of the things that astonished me when it happened was to learn how actually common it is. And it's something that I had never heard anyone talk about, I think partly because it's so painful and because it's so terrifying. I mean, who wants to think that that could possibly happen? And so it felt important to name it and uh, and really bring it into the light and also share the story of this beautiful being who nobody but me and her father really got to know. Yeah. Yeah. You you tell it so beautifully. I can remember where I was as I was reading the story of your daughter and crying in the airplane <laughs> as I read it. Yeah. yeah. So 
I imagine you had a lot of trepidation about the idea of going back into going back into and opening yourself up to the idea of, of pregnancy and parenthood again after that. Well, I had I was certainly afraid in a way that I had not been with my first pregnancy. And I had no doubt that I wanted to do it again. It wasn't a question of, oh, could I put myself through this again and open to the potential of that kind of loss? Because I already knew that the love was worth the risk of the loss. And that what I think one of the lessons I had come away with from that first experience with my daughter, Sierra, was that we never know what's going to happen that loving somebody is inherently a risky thing to do because there's actually no doubt that at some point we're going to lose them. And it may be after 90 years of love and enjoyment of one another, or it could be at any moment. And so that's one of the profound things that parenting teaches you to do is to love somebody so deeply well, really living every day with the reality that they could be lost. So I imagine that's where your practices of coming back to the present moment again and again and practices of learning to tolerate the difficult feelings, tolerate the intensity of being alive, right? Being able to be um, be able to be with all of those feelings, the, that's where this the rubber really, really met the road, I'm sure, for you. Absolutely. Because one of the things that mindfulness practice really teaches us is that we don't get to pick and choose what we're present for. We don't get to switch off and go numb for things that are challenging or difficult and then just switch on our ability to feel and sense for those beautiful, joyful moments that we really need to train our capacity because life contains both. And it's so important if we want to be present for those precious, joyful, miraculous moments of being a parent, the laughter and the love and the connection, that we be able to also be present for the moments when our children are difficult, when they aren't behaving exactly the way we wish they were behaving, uh, for the moments of frustration or sleep deprivation or irritation, disappointment, that our mindfulness practice really teaches us to hold the whole spectrum so that we can be we can really include not just our whole experience, but our child's whole being in our hearts and awareness. Yeah, that, that ability to hold all of your own feelings it makes it is part of what gives you the ability to be able to be present and, and, and be there for your child's emotions and experiences, which can be hard to handle. That, that's the, the very nature of, of being able to be there, right? It's to to practice that with ourselves first. Exactly. So that when our child is throwing a tantrum because they can't have something that they want, we can know in our own being, yeah, I know what that feels like. That's frustrating. I've had to feel what it's like to want something and not be able to have it. And I know that sometimes it's hard even as an adult to, to respond appropriately in that kind of situation. And so that we can make sp space for, allow our child to have those feelings while still offering them a kind of a modeling and skills for uh, learning gradually in an age appropriate way to, uh, to manage their emotions and respond to situations rather than getting overwhelmed and reacting. So when you grew up, in your family, you, you had a, a big family, right? A big Catholic family. What was modeled for you? Was this stuff that you had to learn to be able to be be present for these feelings? Or, or um, what was what was sort of the method of handling difficult feelings that was modeled for you in your own family? Well, first of all, as as you've named, I had a very large family. I was the youngest of seven children, and 
um, the oldest of my siblings was 15 when I was born. And so um, my mother had a lot of children and she also had help from the older children. So in a sense, especially in my very early years, I was raised by a kind of a collective. I know mm. that my mother relied quite a bit on, um, on my older siblings. And, uh, and also there were a lot of stresses in my early years on my family because my father was in the military and when I was six weeks old, he left for Vietnam and mm -hmm. he was there for the first year of my life really. And, and then returned a couple of more times. So a good part of the first seven years of my life, he was gone and my mother was effectively a single mother of seven children, um, which as you can imagine is a lot. I can't even. <laughs> so my mother was an amazing mother and this was really before the era of a lot of the kinds of tools we have now. My mother was definitely not practicing mindfulness meditation <laughs> with, the, with these children. And, and also I think because there was such an extraordinary stressor of the war going mm. on in the background, um, there was a lot that was not named. I would not say that I grew up with a modeling of, you know, conscious naming of emotions and working with them. It was much more, I think my mother was really focused on having me have the happiest childhood that I could. And she certainly wasn't naming the terror that she must have been feeling having mm. her husband away at war during that time. Mm. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's an incredible, incredible weight to sort of live through. And then, but, and then you, but you had almost like eight other mothers or wait, seven, six, sorry, I'm, I'm yes. multiplying your family as we go. Right. <laughs> and so there's, there's all that sort of child energy too there. Uh, I imagine there was a lot of like great watching the siblings and all of that stuff, kind of seeing what they do. Exactly, exactly. Although, you know, because of the age of my older siblings, they also began to leave. I think my oldest daughter, I mean, my oldest sister left for college when I was uh, probably nine months old. So there was also a lot of coming and going of the older ones. And I think in a sense, my turning to meditative practice, which I became involved in when I was a teenager, actually, when I went off to college, was in part a coming to terms with and processing some of the turbulence of those early years and the feelings of, uh, of unsettledness and moving and people I loved going away and coming back was something that I think I was not taught to deal with as a child and so really turned to meditation practice to uh, make room for and be with some of those early emotions. Mm. So when you got pregnant again, and ultimately you, you had your son, one of my favorite parts of this book, which I'm kind of surprised it was my favorite parts <laughs> because it was notes from, you have a chapter uh, called Sutra 4, Notes from a Three-Month Baby Retreat. And I'm kind of surprised it was my favorite parts because it's not exactly a time I want to come back and relive for myself um, was the, the first days of a newborn. But you took some amazing, wonderful notes as a writer in that time and have some incredible details. And I also love the way that you talk about, you compare this experience to a spiritual retreat. You know, you you start the chapter by saying in the ancient scriptures of yoga and Buddhism, you won't find any accounts of a woman beginning her spiritual journey by nursing a newborn baby. I love that you had the presence of mind to go into this with this mindset. Um, do you think that maybe that was partially because of your early experience with Sierra? Tell me a little bit about deciding to say, I'm going to come into this, these crazy intense early days and look at this as a spiritual practice. Partly that was just because I had been practicing for so long, I had really decided beforehand that everything I experienced in my life was going to be grist for the mill. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that was something that had been really ingrained in me through years of practice, that life is, in fact, 
where our practice happens and that there's one dimension of practice that happens on the yoga mat or seated on the meditation cushion in these formal practices, but that re what really matters is where that intersects with life. That's where things go kind of haywire. That's where you lo lose it and remember how to come back. So I went in with that mindset because of my practice. I think because of my experience with Sierra, I was especially attuned to the preciousness and vulnerability of that time. And then also I was a writer and I had been a writer for as long as I had been a spiritual practitioner, practice, practitioner of meditation and yoga. And one of the ways I made sense of my experience always was by writing about it. And so that was part of just how I kept a sense of myself during that time was writing it down. And I had a strong journaling habit established. And so I was journaling a lot, as you can tell from that, um, those chapters, not as much as I would have <laughs> if my baby slept a little more, perhaps. But, <laughs> but I was grabbing notes whenever I could. And I remember sitting because, as you've read, he was such a fussy sleeper that I had to hold him a lot. And so I would have him cradled in one arm and be typing with one hand on the laptop or you know, have him in the crook of my elbow and be typing, just trying to get down some of the rush of what I was feeling in that stage. And what I felt that I was learning about myself and also the real parallels to spiritual practice because both yoga and meditation practices, one of the things they ask you to do is test yourself in an in a, a extreme situation in a certain way. So mm -hmm. in yoga poses, there's that practice of going into and um, playing the edge of your limitations in a, in a physical um, shape and seeing what you learn from being an intensity or holding a shape longer than you might otherwise have held it and seeing what arises. Or in a meditation retreat, there's sitting in meditation long past the time when your more superficial wishes would have said, let's get up and go do something else, that you stay and you stay and see what gets revealed. And that's part of what motherhood was doing for me. Can I stay with this? Can I be with this? Can I be in the intensity and stay centered? Mm. I, I love that you were able to do that. When my first daughter was born, I had been meditating for two years. What I felt like a very steady practice, was very, I was very proud of myself for having meditated for that long. And I thought, oh, this is going to be great. It had transformed my life so profoundly. I used to have these like incredible emotional sort of ups and downs and I really don't like kind of for all of my life. And then I just, I don't have these, these dips that I used to have. I haven't had them since, since I began my practice. Like I don't just fall into a pit of despair every w couple of weeks <laughs> the way I used to. Right. Um, and so it was this profound transformation for me. So I kind of had these like soaring expectations of like, this is amazing. And your experience was so much more grounded in the reality and the difficulty. And I, for, for me, those expectations going in, I, I was like hit by a train <laughs> as far as how challenging it was. And I'm, I was really, um, as I was reading and I felt so connected to you and your story, I felt very proud of you for how you handled it <laughs> kind of in those moments and, and very impressed. But I also love the humor in, in which you share the stories. You have a wonderful story of um, like going to get, you know, the forest finally fell asleep and the doorbell rang. This is like sometime before day 19 or something, right? And, and you go to get the doorbell and, you know, you get the envelope and you tell the man to you know, she's sleeping and, um, and this guy's averting his eyes and he scurries away and you, on the way back, I love this. You, you wrote like that you glanced into the bathroom mirror and, and saw that you had, you had a breast out from breastfeeding and there was a streak of spit up on your shoulder and below, you, you know, there was some yellow poop stain somewhere in your unbrushed hair and your eyes are red rimmed and you wrote, who have I become? And then you wrote that meditation practice is supposed to crack the facade of the construct of self 
So something more real shows through. And then this is a great line you wrote. Is that what is happening here or am I just losing it? (laughs) (laughs) So I imagine there were like days of kind of questioning. I mean, so in that time, were were you questioning your choices during those early days? Well, I certainly wasn't questioning the the <laughs> choice to have a child. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. No, no, not that. that no. <laughs> but I definitely had. It's a very humbling experience because, like you, I had had this feeling that because of my practice, I I had it. I I was going to be able to handle this. And first of all, first illusion that I had was that because of my practice and I'd done all this meditation and I ate all the right things and I, you know, took my B vitamins that my baby was going to be a very calm baby. It was going to be one of those babies you hear about who, when you come home from the hospital, they sleep through the night and wasn't going to fuss or cry because I was going to carry him in a sling and that was going to cause that all of those problems to go away so that was the first delusion that shattered um and you could see i still have the books that i purchased during that period and they all have titles like the fussy baby book or you know sleep (laughs) sleep magic and Mm -hmm. all of these things Uh, because i did not have a calm an easy baby. I had a baby who fell on what you would call the challenging spectrum. I had a baby who um, was colicky and cried a lot and and it woke up very easily. And so I'd finally get him to sleep. And then if I unsnapped the snaps on the, on the baby carrier, that would wake him up. Mm. So he had a very sensitive nervous system and things. He wasn't one of these easily portable babies. I would see them sometimes, you know, mom's out to lunch and the baby in the car seat just snoozing away on the restaurant table next to them. That was not how things were for my son. And so that was one surprise. And then the other was that I thought even when it was difficult, I was going to be this serene, calm Buddha mom who was going to be able to handle everything and kind of keep it all together. And I, that was not the case for me. I was melting down and I wasn't remembering to you know, put, close up my nursing top after he was done, and especially because it seemed like he was never done. So uh, it really was a challenge, but that to me is where meditation practice and mindfulness practice gets really interesting. So there's this illusion that it's kind of like a slot machine. You put in your practice or your time on the cushion, (laughs) and then out comes, you know, out of the vending machine, this beautiful, calm, you know, new version of yourself. And if that were the case, there wouldn't really be any learning. And Mm. so the learning just as a yoga practice gets interesting in those difficult poses, you know, not the ones that you do perfectly the first time, but in the ones that are harder for you, that you don't like, that, you know, your body doesn't open into. Those are the places where you learn to open. And that's where you learn where you need to gain more strength or gain more flexibility. Um, That's the case with a meditation practice as well. And so it really illuminates we can kind of get curious. Oh, wow. When I get sleep deprived, everything goes out the window. How interesting is that? And find out what there is for us to learn in that place. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I, um, uh, I absolutely agree. Seeing these, seeing these incredible challenges as teachers, it's really the only option because otherwise, you know, we, we use that sort of, you know, a strong muscle of judgment and just condemn ourselves. So we, we, you know, we have to learn, right. And in, in some ways, like, I feel like we, we must take this and, and try to try to grow from that. Kind of looking back now, is there, is there any advice you would have given yourself as a, the mom of a newborn, if you could, um, from this perspective, is there anything you would, anything you would share with her that, that she didn't really realize then? I think I would say, which I imagine people did say to me and that I didn't fully hear, it all goes by so fast and it all changes so fast. And so there's this way when you're the mother of a newborn, 
that you think this is how it's going to be, even though intellectually, rationally, you know that it's going to change really fast um, and that your child at five years won't be the same person they are as a baby. When you're in it, it's just very hard to grasp that. It feels permanent. And uh, so I think understanding as fully as you can how fleeting it is both helps you have spaciousness for the difficult moments, but also really makes you cherish those beautiful uh, moments of love and connection and the preciousness of having a very new baby uh, because it, it just goes in a flash. And um, that's part of the beauty of a child going up, growing up, but it's also part of the poignancy that that little baby, I think I wrote this in one of the one of the pieces I wrote, even if things go completely right, especially if they go completely right, that baby will be gone. And there will be a beautiful five-year-old or teenager or young adult in their place who you will love immensely um, with a love that deepens with every new incarnation. And that particular incarnation of your child is completely vanished. So cherish, cherish those moments and really sink into them. Let yourself be present for them because they are so fleeting. Mm, it's so true. My daughter is 12 now. And you know how um, uh, Facebook pops up some memories sometime and it popped up a memory yesterday for my husband of her when she was three years old and she had flowers in bo behind both ears and just this incredible smile and her face is like wider than it is tall. <laughs> and she's this sort of tall string bean now. And, um, and yeah, I, I think it's funny, you know, as you talk about that, like for me, I remember when people say, mostly older ladies would say like, just enjoy every minute. And I would kind of feel like F you <laughs> in that right. moment because I was struggling so much. But also I think there, there was a, a point where I realized like, oh, this is really speeding up, you know? And maybe when my oldest daughter um, started to, started, went to school, maybe for the first time, like a, a five day kindergarten program. And I was like, wow. And I sort of halfway through that, time, I realized, wow, you know, that the, I kind of felt the speeding up and the change of it. And now I really feel where my daughter is nine and 12, the sense of like, oh, like there's, it's so, there's that, that intensity really does wane. You know, when you're in that early childhood phase, when you're in that babyhood phase, you're like, oh my God, I'm in this forever. I'm I'm a parent forever now, and I'm ne it's, it's always going to be this intense, and and it really isn't after a while. And I think that is hopefully, if dear listener, if you have tiny children, you can open your heart to hear this message and take it in from from these moms of older older children now. Yes, and also I think related to that, another piece of advice I would give to myself is not to be so hard on myself and not to have such high expectations of all the other things that I should be doing in addition to being the most perfect, present, mindful, caring mom. You know, I think I, and I think it's true for a lot of new mothers, I had a lot of expectations that I should be able to do this and do, you know, be achieving, you know, great things professionally and, you know, showing up in all of these world ways in the world at the, you know, all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And just to cut a little slack and in every area, cut yourself some slack as a mother. You will make mistakes and you won't be perfectly present and you'll get mad at your kid and there'll be times when you just need to, you know, veg out and, and uh, not be giving them 100% of your attention. And there will be things in your work life that you may need to cut back on because you're simply exhausted and you've got energy going in another direction. And that again, that will all shift in really a few years and you'll have more time. But I think I beat myself up a lot 
for not accomplishing things that retrospectively, it was completely unrealistic of myself to expect that I was doing at the same time that I was, was raising a child. Yeah, our expectations for mothers are crazy. You know, we're supposed to, we're supposed to be the perfect, caring, present, wonderful person and who never yells. And our house is supposed to be amazing. And we'll have the perfect wooden toys for our, our organic baby. And, um, and we'll accomplishing great things in the world as well and look great doing it. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And it's really, it's that myth of perfectionism is something that we can come down on ourselves so hard about. And then if we're meditation practitioners or yoga practitioners, then we add all of the Mm -hmm. expectations around that as well. Like, oh, I do yoga. I'm not supposed to get depressed. I'm not supposed to get anxious or angry or my back isn't supposed to go out, right? Because I have this yoga practice or I'm a meditation practitioner. I'm not supposed to get in a big fight with my significant other or the my spouse or the parent of my child. Um, I'm, I'm supposed to be serene and calm at all times and just to make room for our full humanity and to have a practice that really does that, that's based in this kind of compassion for ourselves and others and the ways that we make mistakes. Amen, and Amen. So now one thing I noticed as I was like reading your about sort of that early childhood time, you were very giving to your to your son. You were really immersed in this experience. A question I had was like about your partner, you know, thinking back to that time, were there places where you could have step back a little and given yourself some some more space to to just be in and not in you know, always holding the baby. I'm just, that's something I'm kind of curious about kind of it as you're, you know, as you have this perspective, because I know you were practicing attachment parenting, which is something I did too, but sometimes it can be a little heavy on the mom is everything side, you know? I was fortunate because I had a work situation where I was largely working from home, um, but I did work during those early years. And um, I was also fortunate that I didn't have to work out of the house full time. Mm. Um, I had financial support from my husband. And when we weren't together anymore, he also offered child support. So that that combined with my working um, really freelance um, and part time gave me uh, it gave me and also the fact that my practice my spiritual practice and my work were so closely allied so I had space to to explore and give time to those other aspects of myself which was actually tied in with my work so I mean just to be more explicit I was working as an editor and writer in those early years for a Buddhist magazine called Tricycle. And so I was writing about practice and I was practicing as part of my research for my writing. And I was immersed in editing other people's writing about spiritual topics. And I was doing that from home so that, for instance, when my son was still breastfeeding, I could pause and and go and breastfeed his dad or a babysitter or when he was in preschool would be watching my son while I was working and writing. And then I was also teaching. I was teaching yoga and meditation. And teaching is a powerful way to keep your practice on on track. Mm -hmm. So... (laughs) So I I wasn't twenty four seven with my child. Mm. So so I'm good. I'm really glad to hear that you had support and you you got that support. Um, when now when your son was young, I'd love for you to talk to us a little bit about him having a diagnosis and how you guys approach that. Do you mind sharing a little bit about that? Yeah. So he was my first child, so I had nothing to compare him to. And so I didn't realize that some of the some of his orientation or behaviors or fussiness or eccentricities 
uh, were problematic, other than that they were a little difficult for me, until my sister-in-law, who is a child psychologist, pointed them out to me. And she said, you should get him evaluated. There are, uh, there are things that he's doing that really aren't within the normal spectrum of childhood development. Um, he was a super smart and verbal and highly inquisitive child, but he had some grammatical irregularities that she pointed out as problematic. Um, he, re he reversed his pronouns. And he was also super sensorially sensitive and um, couldn't be in overstimulating situations, which was a lot of things like, you know, crowds, birthday parties, um, anything where there was a lot of noise. Um, and, uh, and he was highly, he almost had more adult interests so that if you took him to a playground, for instance, he was not interested in going on the swings or going on the slide. He wanted to sit by the side of the playground and categorize the wildflowers and learn their <laughs> names and discuss how they were grown and, you know, ask questions about gravity and light. <laughs> so I just thought, oh, I have kind of an eccentric genius child, but I didn't realize that um, there were some problems associated with this. And so um, I, we took him to a, a, a child psychologist at the recommendation of my sister-in-law, and she diagnosed him as being on the autism spectrum. In those days, the words they used were Asperger's syndrome, although I don't know they, if they break it down in that same way now. And... Uh, which was devastating for me. I'd never heard of it. I didn't know what it meant. I did a little, lot of research and thought that it meant that my son would have no friends. And um, it was very uh, heartbreaking and worrisome for me, mainly around his happiness. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I did a little more research and I, it was a combination of doing research and then tuning into what I deeply knew from my own yoga and meditation practice, that um, we're fluid beings and that the mind is fluid, the brain is fluid, the, um, the patterns of our mind and body are intimately related. And that, uh, that I did, really didn't want to fit my child into a diagnostic box. And instead, what we chose to do is rather than clinging to a name for a set of behaviors and characteristics, to look at the specifics of it and see what we could do. Uh, the way I articulate it to myself is every human being is a group, is a collection of strengths and weaknesses. And often these things are intimately intertwined. So for instance, his inability to be in a, a one-year-old's birthday party where children are shrieking and noisemakers are, are going off was intimately related to his ability to, you know, hear the sound of a mosquito and comment on what note of the scale the, the mosquito was humming at, <laughs> um, that it was a kind of sensitivity and how could we lessen the negative aspects of that sensitivity and, and enhance and support the gifts of it. So we, and fortunately, we had caught some of this early, thanks to the early um, consultations we were having. So we embarked on a real intensive program of um, both social skills training and occupational therapy, uh, uh, mainly working with sensory sensitivities. And um, it was in our case, amazingly transformative. And so as I wrote in the book, by the time he was probably six, I can't even remember now, the child psychologist said, oh, he's outgrown his diagnosis. He, we no longer characterize him as being on the autistic spectrum. However, now we believe that he's gifted and you need a whole other set of supports for a, a gifted child. So uh, that, and, and I don't want to say this in the sense of, uh, of minimizing or pointing to anyone else's experience that mm -hmm. I know that every child has their own unique trajectory. Um, but in our case, it was a real uh, 
affirmation for me of this idea that what we think of as a fixed self is actually a constantly changing flow and that we can really impact the direction and trajectory of that flow by what we support and what we um, what we mirror back to our children and how um, what sort of experiences we offer them. Mm, yeah, yeah, and I love how you you brought in um, also with that the story. There's a, a parable of a of a farmer who this ter- these terrible things happen and say, oh, everyone says it's terrible, and he says maybe, and then you know something good happens from that, and they all say, oh, that's wonderful, and he says maybe, and it goes on and on like that because this is such a your story is such a wonderful exemplar of that. Um, I want to just to, mm-hmm. just to finish out the the story and just to reassure <laughs> listeners, my son is off at college now. He's doing fantastic. He has many friends. He has a great girlfriend. He is in uh, multiple leadership positions. He plays in a band. Uh, you know, he plays plays guitar. He uh, he's a creative and happy and flourishing young adult. Yay. So I say this often to, to because often people through friends have heard about my experience and come to me when they have diagnoses for their children that they find very alarming, especially around these kind of behavioral things. And I always say to them, you just have no idea what's going to happen. Do not make any assumptions about your child. Um, just, you know, based on a diagnosis at age two or three or four, and just continue to see the incredible gifts and beauty and possibilities in your unique being and know that every human being has challenges and limitations and every human being has something wonderful to offer the world and just keep holding your child in that light and moving forward. Mm, that's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. And we need that reminder all the time, right? To not make any assumptions about our child, to, to stop um, stop our stories and, and kind of get take, take a, a larger perspective. And I'm, I'm really hoping that your words give some perspective for, for the listener who may have a child who, you know, who may be struggling with a child. Um, and I want to sort of go back to, you know, you quote Thich Nhat Hanh, the Zen Buddhist monk and and peace activist and master, um, as saying, you know, when somebody asked him the difference between a lay practice, meaning a, and a monastic practice, like I'm someone who's in a monastery versus somebody who's out in the world, he said, they're exactly the same practice, he said, but the monastic practice is easier. <laughs> and I think that's I think that's true and I I just I want to kind of circle back to this idea of this you know one of the spiritual principles that you you keep kind of coming back to and touching down on in in your book and also is this idea and what you just said what we think of as a fixed self is a constantly changing flow and to be able to see that constant change in our children, they're kind of teachers for seeing it in others, but also for seeing it in ourselves, I guess, as well. Exactly. Exactly. That, you know, I think I remember once when my son was about nine and we were sitting down to watch a video. I forget what it was, but there was something a little scary in it. And I turned to him and I said, is this too scary for you? And he looked at me and he said, mom. I think you're confusing me with an earlier version of myself. <laughs> and I think that we do that with ourselves as well. We lock into a particular idea of who we are, or we, in our mind, we freeze our sense of ourself at a certain point, either, and then compare ourselves to that point, either favorably or unfavorably. And to really know that what we think of as ourself is constantly changing constantly evolving and that we have the opportunity to influence that that transformation in particular directions is a really powerful realization and to know that that uh, 
like our children, we have limitations and we have strengths and that we can support our strengths and that we can um, work with our limitations in a kind and compassionate way. And that we can, uh, we can begin again, really, over and over again, as our meditation practice teaches us to do, is a very liberating thing. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes, we can begin anew again and again and again. And and yeah, we have the the power to influence it. Like what we practice grows stronger. So what what do we want to practice? Well, I I know that the listener is is probably feeling just like me and feeling like this time spent um, shared with you is watering those good seeds, watering those seeds of great wisdom and perspective that are are really needed in a really fast paced really distracting world so i i want to thank you for thank you so much for for sharing um sharing your writing and your stories and your wisdom in the book in the mama sutra and also um for for sharing it here with me and with the listener it, it creates ripple effects that that make an incredible positive difference. So so thank you, Anne. And thank you, Hunter. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. I know that it's helpful to many, many mothers to have your wisdom shared with them. Oh, thank you very much. And so I can't neglect to ask if people want to know know more about you and the work that you're doing, if they want to go on a retreat with you, if they're lucky enough to, to live in California, how can people find out more about you and the work you're doing? Well, they can go to my website, annkushman.com, and there you'll see um, uh, lists of my books and a calendar of my upcoming retreat. Uh, upcoming retreats and also a way to get in touch with me if you have a question or want to reach out or just have a response to the Mama Sutra. I've been getting some wonderful, wonderful emails from readers, which has been really touching. They've been sending me their stories and pictures of their babies. and It's been really wonderful to be in touch with the community of mothers in this way. Yes, yes. Dear listener, get the Mama Sutra. I can't recommend it highly enough. It is definitely a book that you'll be passing around in your circle. I'm giving it to my mom next. Um, and 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 you won't regret it. And, and actually, Anne, as the listener, you know, she Anne writes about her her daughter who was stillborn, but there are also, which is it is powerful and 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 gives an incredible perspective. And there are laugh out loud moments <laughs> in this book. I was just like, ah, ha, ha, and I would share it with my family. So I appreciate those laugh out loud moments too, Anne. Thank you. Well, you have, you balance them really beautifully. <laughs> well, it's the trajectory of a life. It contains everything ultimately. Yes. Awesome. Oh, I'm so grateful you were able to be here. Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you, Hunter. Goodbye. Thank you so much for listening. Doesn't Anne just touch you so deeply? I feel like she's such a, a deep and wise teacher for me, and I hope that you really get that sense too. If you want to talk about this podcast, you want to share your takeaways, join the free Mindful Mama Tribe uh, group on Facebook, uh, and you can find that by going to mindfulmamamentor.com. We are a group of 4,000 strong mamas there. And the whole, you know, just to, to let you know, the whole tribe, we are over 20,000 people who are, you know, doing this work of transforming generational patterns. So you are in good company. Good for you. Rock on. I am, I am so glad you're here. Remember that you can subscribe and leave a rating, and you should. Not only can you, you should to support the podcast. Make sure you don't miss a single episode. Just want to let you know that later this year, the Mindful Parenting membership is coming. It's on its way. But if you could do me one favor right now and subscribe and leave a rating wherever you listen, whether it's Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or whatever, it makes a huge difference 
helps support the podcast. And even better than all of that is actually to share it with the friends, like, you know, take a screenshot of you listening to the podcast, send it to me on Instagram so I can be like, yay, but also send it to your friends and say, this is a great episode if you think that it is. So I, that would be awesome. And it would help other people find this. So that is, that is my, my, my loving ask of you today. I hope that you are having a fabulous summer. If you are in the Northern Hemisphere and it happens to be summer, if you, I hope you are warm and cozy this winter to my New Zealander and Australia's Australian and other South Southern Hemisphere mamas. Shout out to Chile. Yeah, I'm wishing you some peace this week. I, I'm wishing you some perspective that this podcast is giving you some perspective to help see that big picture and maybe cherish these days, even the difficult ones. So have a wonderful week, my friend. Wishing you all the best. I'll talk to you soon next week. Namaste.